Good afternoon. Welcome to this meeting of the Indiana Justice Reinvestment Advisory Council. I want to start by thanking all of our council members for taking time out of your busy schedules to participate in this important meeting. My name is Chris Goff, and I've been designated by Chief Justice Loretta Rush to serve as the JRAC chair. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to serve uh, in this important role. Later in the agenda, I'm going to ask all of the JRAC council members to report out on the important work that is being completed by their constituent groups. I'm also going to ask for them to report out on any specific work or news that might affect and benefit the work of JRAC as a whole. The first agenda item I'm going to address today is approval of the August 12th, 2020 meeting minutes. All of the JRAC members should have received a copy of those minutes from April Dubree in advance of today's meeting. I'd ask first if there is any discussion concerning the meeting minutes from August 12th. And hearing none, I would entertain uh, a motion to accept or approve the minutes as presented. So moved. Justice Scoff, I'm, uh, this is Adam McQueen. I make a motion to accept the meeting minutes. Thank you, Adam. And Bernice, would you second that motion then? All right, thank you. So there is a motion to approve the minutes by Adam McQueen and a second by Bernice Corley. Is there any further discussion? Hearing no call for discussion. All those in favor of appro approving the minutes as uh, presented, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, very well, thank you. Uh, the next agenda item is uh, following up on something that we had begun to discuss at an earlier meeting, and that is on a proposed mapping uh, exercise of Indiana's mental health delivery system. And I'm going to ask uh, Mary Kay Hudson as the Executive Director of the Indiana Office of Court Services to provide members an update on uh, the proposed mapping exercise. Mary Kay? Yes, thank you, Justice Goff. Um, some of you may remember that at a previous meeting, there was a discussion about um, the Office of Court Services involvement with the National Center for State Courts, as well as a small, a smaller group of individuals from Indiana um, who were exploring the possibility of doing um, a, a mapping of Indiana's behavioral health service delivery system. Um, it's very similar to the sequential intercept model, um, taking a look at how justice involved in, the individuals can access behavioral health systems across this, every point in the system. Um, so we engaged in that uh, um, just a little bit, not quite a year ago with the National Center for State Courts. There were a number of us from Indiana who went to a conference in Deadwood, South Dakota um, to learn a little bit more about how we can um, examine our behavioral health del service delivery system as well as make improvements to it. So the individuals who were present at that meeting in Deadwood uh, were Justice Goff, myself, Justin Forkner from the Office of Judicial Administration, Senator Sandlin, Doug Huntinger, uh, Jay Chaudray and Sheriff Brett Clark from Hendricks County. Um, so what we are proposing um, moving forward with this project um, is to, to receive some assistance from the National Center for State Courts in doing some facilitated discussions with some of our state and local criminal justice stakeholders to learn a little bit more about the way in which um, individuals within the local systems access behavioral health care, um, what the opportunities are, what, what some of the gaps and services are, and what some of our opportunities are. Um, to really look at the system from top to bottom, both from a state perspective and from a local perspective. What we hope to gain from that um, is essentially a map of all the behavioral health opportunities that justice involved individuals have access to, but also to identify any gaps in services or er any areas in which we can improve access to behavioral health treatment. Um, so that could look um, in the form of legislation, it could be um, training and education, it could be technical assistance, um, and in many cases, it could be just providing local jurisdictions some support um, as they learn a little bit more about the behavioral health needs in their community um, and helping people connect individuals with resources. So our plan for that is to um, start conducting some stakeholder interviews 
um, what we would like to do is get permission from uh, the different members of the council um, to, to get their permission to participate in these interviews um, because we would be reaching out to each of you um, and then perhaps even a designee if someone from your agency is better equipped to speak towards some of the questions regarding behavioral health and the justice system. And then we would also uh, propose talking with some local stakeholders about their experiences in their community about access to behavioral health care. Um, from that, we would identify strengths, opportunities, challenges, um, as well as use it as an, as an opportunity to educate various stakeholders about what may be available or what we could do to improve access to services. Um, so we, we would propose starting this in October. Um, we would imagine conducting maybe small focus groups or even individual interviews with stakeholders, probably for about an hour at a time. Um, and from those interviews, we would develop a narrative or a map of Indiana's behavioral health uh, system. And from that, again, we would develop um, a list of strengths, opportunities, challenges, um, and ways in which we can improve access to services. We think that this will complement the work of JRAC. We think that it, um, one component of it could be access to behavioral health care in jails, for example, um, behavioral health care for individuals who are on supervision. Um, so we think it will, will go nicely with the initiatives of the Jail Overcrowding Task Force, the pretrial and bail reform report, um, and then in the, of the future initiatives of the Justice Reinvestment Advisory Council um, with the evidence-based decision-making initiative. So Justice Goff, we would plan to kick that off next month. Um, and for members who are willing to participate, um, you'll be receiving an invitation from me um, for probably about an hour long interview. And then we'll go from there. I'm, I, I'm happy to answer any questions about the process. So I was gonna invite questions. Thank you very much for that summary, Mary Kay. Um, are there any questions from any members of the council? Just a comment. Uh, real quick, uh, Jay Chaudhary, EMHA, uh, this does line up really well with um, our efforts to make the community mental health centers uh, get more involved with uh, the justice and jail diversion population. So there's some nice alignment here. Um, Mary Kay, when do you expect that we would see results? Senator Talion, if we conduct interviews through the month of October, I would imagine we would have a report compiled by the end of the year. Um, and certainly we, we can share information as we go uh, with the council and keep people up to date. Uh, if so, for example, if there happened to be anything that we identified fairly quickly um, that, uh, that could um, legislative changes could help, uh, we can share that information with the council and see if there's any opportunities there. Okay, just asking because, you know, we we will have a bill deadline sometime, probably early December. So anything that you can get to the legislature before then would be good. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, this is Wendy McNamara. Um, it would be helpful if either Mary Kay, uh, Jay, um, or even the Honorable uh, Mark Spitzer were to come to testify on the 6th for um, the Corrections and Criminal Code Committee. Um, we were supposed to have some mental health treatment conversation on uh, this past Tuesday. A couple groups got confused. Um, but if you wanna come speak to what you're trying to accomplish there, I'd, I'd like, um, I think that would be a good opportunity. Um, there's two ways you can testify, one's via a seven minute video. The other would be coming in person to the state house and testifying there. But um, if the judge could testify on the pretrial risk is that he's, uh, you were the chair of that, correct, I believe. And then um, it's kind of the culmination of 1006 and the, the review of it, but mental health is a huge part of it. I do know a group from Evansville is coming up to speak to what their vision is for um, treatment of mental health on that day, but it would also be very important, I think, to hear it publicly in a, in a interim study committee. If you can possibly do that, I would appreciate it. Representative McNamara, I will plan on doing that, um, and I can connect with Judge Spitzer um, and Jay about what information would be helpful. Mary Kay, I've got a, uh, I do have a jury trial scheduled for that day, so I don't know if there's something I can do ahead of time or um, coordinate that in some way 
um, but but I wouldn't be available at that time because of my jury trial, but I, I'm certainly willing to help in any way that I can. Well, and thank you, uh, Representative McNamara, for that invitation, and thank you, Judge, uh, one of our busiest judges, for uh, your, your willingness to help whenever called. I, I really think that this work is just of the utmost importance, so I, I really uh, will make sure that that's covered, uh, Representative McNamara, and uh, to the extent that you need any additional information uh, throughout the legislative uh, schedule, and certainly Senator Italian, this goes for you as well, or any of our legislative partners, we're eager to share it. Um, there's been a lot of balls up in the air with this uh, process, but I, I think that um, when you get the end product, uh, it, it'll, it'll really be worth the effort. So thank you. Is there anything else before we move on then uh, with our next agenda item? Well, next uh, is item four on, on your agenda, and that is a report from the JRAC Quick Response Group. And I'm going to ask for um, some updates from several different uh, subgroups of the Quick Response Group. Uh, first, um, an update and discussion regarding case studies on local jail populations and a study commissioned by Indiana University. And for that item, I'd ask for a report from, uh, again, Mary Kay. Thank you, Justice Goff. I want to discuss the fact that the JRAC Quick Response Group um, identified a need to take a look at the county jail populations um, in the midst of the pandemic, just to see, um, we have, we, the Sheriff's Association and the Department of Correction had reported some significant changes and in many cases, significant reductions in local jail populations since the start of the pandemic. Um, so this group uh, identified a need to take a look at some of those jurisdictions who were experiencing changes in jail population to determine what changes in policy or practice may have resulted in those changes. Um, so with the, with the information that the Sheriff's Association provided to us regarding um, snapshots of local jail populations that were taken in March and then again in July, um, a smaller group of the quick response group identified 11 counties um, across the state that they wanted to learn a little bit more about what was happening during that period of time so we could get a better understanding of what, what impact the pandemic had on their local jail population. And we did select 11 counties, um, but not all of those counties were counties that had exhibited drastic reductions in their jail population. And the reason that we chose uh, a cross section of counties was because we know that from our experience working with some of those jurisdictions, um, they're facing a, a diverse group of issues um, in terms of the population centers, um, what some of the practices may be regarding pretrial services and criminal rule 26, their access to behavioral health care in the jail. So we really wanted to do a cross section um, of counties who had both experienced significant reductions as well as those that had had more modest reductions but counties where we knew there were really some innovative things going on as it relates to the jail population and access to services. The counties that we are working with are Cass County, Grant, Hamilton, Huntington, Martin, Monroe, Montgomery, St. Joseph, Vanderburg, Vigo, and Wayne. And so what we are doing um, is we are contacting the criminal justice stakeholders in that, those communities just to learn a little bit about what impact the pandemic has had on their local criminal justice system and more specifically the jail. Um, and what we're learning is that there are a variety of things that have contributed to the local jail population changes, um, some of which may persist post pandemic. Um, some are conditions that are unique to the pandemic that remains to be seen once we move through the pandemic, um, what that will do to jail populations. What we do know is that the jail populations in many jurisdictions are beginning to rise again. Um, so those are the conversations that we're having with the local stakeholders just to learn a little bit more about that. Um, our goal is to really highlight the innovations um, and the communication and collaboration that we know is happening at the local level. We want to be sure um, to, to have everyone understand how complex 
um, the jail population is, how dynamic the jail population is, and how many things really contribute to changes in the jail population, um, which fluctuates on an hourly and daily basis. Probably the biggest concern that this group has, has heard from the stakeholders, and I think this is something that this, this group, uh, the council, is, is well aware of, is that we really do need better access to real-time, comprehensive statewide jail data. Um, so that just needs to be continuing, needs to continue to be a conversation and a goal so that we can, in real time, continue to monitor our jail populations because there are so many different um, ways in which someone is in the county jail and sometimes people are in a county jail for multiple reasons that unless we can really track that population the reasons why they're there length of stay um, we're not in a good position to make um, large policy decisions uh, about the jail population unless we have that information so um, the group is continuing to talk to local, local stakeholders and we would anticipate having a summary of those discussions available for the council's review and discussion and is at, your Octo at the October meeting. And then related to that, um, in your meeting materials, um, Indiana University published the first of two reports related to jail populations, both nationally, as well as some work that they're doing here in Indiana. Um, so we had an opportunity to talk with Dr. Grauman um, and Dr. Kevin Martin with IU a little bit about their project and the report that they published in June. Um, we learned uh, that they had gained information about the Indiana jail populations from a firm out in New York who had gathered information from local jail census and local jail systems who publish inmate um, information on their website. Um, so we talked a little bit about the data challenges in, in collecting jail information. Um, we expressed our concerns about the ability to have real-time information, um, and the researchers also expressed um, a need to to shore up our jail data management resources um, so that we can have good information to make decisions. Um, Dr. Grauman, who was one of the principals on the report that was published, also happens to be working with our office on our pretrial evaluation study. So he is really familiar with Indiana jails and Indiana jail information and the diversity of systems in use. Um, so he, he is understanding of the limitations of the jail information that we have, um, and he's supportive of our efforts to improve that. Moving forward with IU's project, uh, one of the things that they would like to do is coordinate with the Sheriff's Association to talk to local sheriffs um, about their experiences during the pandemic. Um, and I think Steve is currently in communications um, with some of his staff um, and some of the sheriffs about their ability to provide information to IU. Um, they are expecting to publish a follow-up report in December of 2020. Um, and so we can expect to see additional information coming from IU. Um, our two groups um, vow to, to stay in communication, to, to work together, um, knowing how complex this is and, and um, how important it is to provide accurate information for the purpose of making policy decisions and recommendations. Um, so we're gonna continue conversations with IU um, as they continue their project for their study. And so I don't know if any of the individuals who are participating in um, looking at the local jail populations um, with our 11 counties or anyone who participated in the conversation that we had with IU would like to add anything to that um, or I'm happy to answer any questions from members. Mary Kay, the only thing I might just add would be that yeah, I, I've been emailing and communicating with Dr. Grauman, and I think what we're going to do is, uh, once we agree on, he, he's continually talking about 20 counties. I'd like to have more involved, but if we can get 20, uh, that we will actually have a live uh, Zoom or a WebEx meeting with the sheriff to make sure they want to participate and to make sure that they have the same contact person through this study. Uh, because I think some of the uh, numbers that we've seen in the past from uh, being self-reported to RDC is because there's not a, a uh, the same person making that contact. So uh, we'll be moving forward and uh, make sure there's a, a meeting uh, with Dr. Brahma so that he can answer any of the questions for the sheriffs. And I know we spoke this week about making sure that the data continually that we're it's consistent in what we're wanting to do with the jail overcrowding uh, committee.
Steve and Mary Kay, I would be remiss if I didn't just take a moment to thank you and all of the members of this group who did just extraordinary work uh, to help us capture uh, just, just what went on over the past few months and, and allow us the best opportunity to learn and, uh, and, and gain going forward. So your, all of your work is uh, sincerely appreciated. Thank you very much. Justice Goff, if I could add one thing that I think the council will be um, pleased to hear is that several of the jurisdictions that we have talked to have, have indicated that they have increased their use of site and release. So rather than taking people into custody, um, for certain types of offenses, they have increased use of citations and several of the counties that we have talked to have indicated that they intend to continue that practice. Um, so that that could have a significant and long term um, positive impact on on reducing the jail population for the lower level nonviolent offenders. Thank you for that, Mary Kay. If there are no other uh, questions for uh, Mary Kay, Steve and, and other members of the, the subgroup, I'm going to ask for uh, Mary Kay to follow up on a, a different topic that was covered by the quick response group. And that is the uh, issue of law school students uh, at initial hearings. Mary Kay. Thank you, Justice Goff. Um, we've had a couple of conversations about how we can improve um, arrestees access to, to counsel at initial hearing. And one of the ideas that was posed was to use uh, third year law students um, as a source for counties who are in need of having um, individuals appear with arrestees at initial hearing who don't have access to um, public defenders or private counsel um, to provide those services. So the um, Indiana Supreme Court does have in the attorney rules um, for admission and discipline um, a process called certified legal interns. And certified legal interns uh, are available. To, you, you may serve as a certified legal, legal intern if you are a law student who has completed a certain number of hours within your, your law school program and you've completed the professional ethics course or if you have graduated from law school and you uh, are waiting to take the bar or receive your bar results. Um, both, both groups of individuals need to have supervision from an attorney um, and a sponsorship from a law school or um, the law school has to communicate with the Indiana Board of Law Examiners um, about that individual status and eligibility to serve as a certified legal intern. So that program currently is in place. Uh, right now we would estimate that we have about between two and 300 individuals who are serving in the capacity of certified legal interns across the state. Most of them, as you can imagine, are probably in pretty close proximity to the law schools. Um, so we would imagine that there may be good opportunities to have certified legal interns serve in this capacity. Um, within those geographic areas that are close to the law schools, which are in South Bend, um, Indianapolis, and Bloomington. Um, but beyond that, um, it may be a little trickier for individuals, and particularly those that are students, to serve in this capacity. Um, the important thing to note is that anyone who is serving as a certified legal intern is required to be supervised by a licensed attorney. So um, that individual can conduct certain activities um, but has to be under the general supervision of a licensed, licensed attorney, as well as any time that individual appears in court, they have to be appearing in court in the presence of a licensed attorney. So there are some opportunities um, to use certified legal interns, for example, in doing interviews with arrestees um, pre-initial hearing. Um, but again, when, once the initial hearing would, would occur in open court, that legal intern would have to be supervised and in the presence of a, of a licensed attorney. So that could pose some limitations, um, but there are some opportunities that are currently in place. Um, and as I said, we probably have between two and 300 individuals who are serving in that capacity right now. So I just wanted to give everyone an update um, that law students are permitted to serve in this way. And I'm happy to answer any questions, um, Justice Goss, or if you or other members of the council have any. Thank you, Mary Kay. Are there any questions from uh, any members of the council? Yes. Justice. Uh, can I go? Uh, Mary Kay, is it possible that, um, you know, I understand that um, uh, Justice uh, Rush put together a program for uh, evictions, um, like, you know, eviction settlement conference, essentially. Can these kids do that? 
Can, may law students serve as facilitators? Is that your question, Senator Talia? Yeah. Um, yeah. Currently, currently, it's an Indiana licensed attorney or a certified uh, mediator in Indiana, which those are not required to be attorneys. Um, that program has not been opened up to law students. Okay. All right. Thank you. Justice Goff, if I may. Yes, Representative Fry. Um, Mary Kay, could a uh, third year law student be supervised by an attorney via Zoom instead of being in the courtroom himself? Representative Fry, that's a good question. That would be a question I would probably need to pose to um, the disciplinary commission um, just to see how they would interpret that under the rules of professional conduct. Looks that's like um, an attorney could supervise several um, in the case that they could do it uh, like we're doing this meeting now. I can find that out, Representative Fry. This Thank is um, Representative Hatcher. I have a question. Yes, please, Representative Hatcher. Thank you. Um, I was the director of the tax clinic at Valpo Law School for a couple of years. And um, we were able to, and a lot of the tax work that we did was directly with the IRS. So we never went into tax court, but we were able to, um, I was the supervisor. I had maybe 15 students or so, and they were able to really learn and work through tax issues, you know, very well as third year law students. Things like the eviction and just having someone there for their initial plea as a public defender, I would think that would be a very um, uh, not only hands on opportunity for the third year law students, but uh, I mean, that's real life experience that they could take with them after uh, they leave law school. So I hope there's a way that we can do it where uh, the attorney may not have to necessarily be present in every courtroom for every initial hearing and I was just wondering if there's a way that um, uh, we could work with the disciplinary commission to see if there's some other way. I heard uh, the, the suggestion through Zoom but just as their uh, supervising attorney it was just my responsibility to review their files and talk to them about each case but they were the ones directly on the phone with the IRS if I was present or not. So I was kind of hoping it could be more of that kind of situation than having to have an attorney present in every hearing with every law student. That may become difficult. Thank you for that, uh, Representative Hatcher. You know, as um, Mary Kay reported on this and I, I got a, a sort of a pre-report from her in advance of the meeting, um, there's clearly a lot of interest in this subject from members of the legislature. And I, I wonder, since I have uh, representatives from the public defense community and also IPAC on the call, uh, I have in my mind that the certified legal intern program is fairly heavily utilized in uh, many of the uh, prosecutor uh, public defender offices in those cities that have close proximity to, to law schools. I, I think of Marion County in particular, where I, I know there are a lot of prosecutors um, who, who go through and actually try cases before they, um, they graduate. Uh, and, and I think that there are some public defenders who have some similar experiences in that office. Would it make any sense to ask uh, those council members or their designees to perhaps reach out to some of their constituent members uh, in some of those offices to, uh, one, determine whether or not they, there would be a need for additional uh, certified legal interns, and, and two, whether they might have any suggestions on uh, any possible revisions that they think would need to be made to the current rules uh, to, to allow for uh, any increase in capacity if, if indeed they, they perceive a need. I, I don't know, um, didn't see exactly who came on for IPAC, but I did see Bernice and, and Mark. Is, uh, would that be something that you might be willing to, to have a, a conversation between this meeting and perhaps the next? Absolutely, I'd be happy to, Justice. Thank you, thank you. Justice uh, Goff, this is Chris Naylor. Hi, Chris. Hi, uh, yes, we'd, we'd be glad to look into that. And I understand, you know, men Marion County has a robust certified legal intern program and uh, also 
uh, Monroe County and the counties contiguous to Monroe County uh, use uh, utilize students from the law school. So we'll, we'll be happy to follow up. But on this, on the topic of initial hearings, I just want uh, all the members to know it uh, through the Indiana Innovation Initiatives. I believe there's going to be a, a pilot program with respect to initial hearings on misdemeanors, whereby uh, the state through prosecutors could uh, discuss and enter into diversion agreements before the initial hearing happens. And so that through that process, we could dramatically reduce the number of initial hearings on misdemeanor cases uh, by 15 to 20 to maybe even 25,000 cases annually. So I just wanted everyone to know that that's a, a positive development. And that's my understanding. It may be about a four county pilot program uh, just to see how that would work. Uh, there's, uh, there would be, there would need to be a change to the uh, rules of professional conduct uh, to, to enable this uh, interaction before initial hearing, but that's a, a really positive development on these uh, misdemeanor cases. Well, Bernice, Chris, uh, thank you. I, it occurs to me that the, the topic is, is probably one that's worth uh, continuing a conversation on but I, I don't have all of the answers for the legislators today. And I'd like to have, uh, as, as I said, and I think you're willing to uh, help us get that information, uh, some better input from uh, those folks who are on the ground. So um, I, I appreciate it. That would be wonderful if we could perhaps uh, hear from you either at the October or the November meeting, um, maybe we'll have a better idea of what we can do going forward. Is there anything else uh, for Mary Kay before we move on to the next uh, subtopic? Well, again, thank you, Mary Kay, for uh, all of your work and, and all of these uh, reports. And the next uh, item I'm going to ask for a report out on is uh, the topic of racial equity and some discussions that have been facilitated uh, and led by Bernice uh, Corley and also from Steve Luce. So, can I ask uh, Bernice and Steve, to report out on uh, what's transpired since our last meeting. Absolutely. Steve, would you like to report out or would you like me to? Oh, Steve, you're muted. Why don't you go ahead, then I can probably give some updates as far as where we're going. Got you. Uh, so I met along with Steve Luce and um, Sheriff Brett Clark uh, to talk about what would make sense as a consensus area to start in this area. And what we came up with is we thought it would be important first, and, and this is in no order of importance, but to increase the communication and education of stakeholders and interested parties around tools that are currently existing that can touch on issues of concern uh, with, with, law, with law enforcement particularly um, for example, decertification, there's been a lot of talk around uh, that idea or interest in that idea, and there's already tools that are existing, and Steve certainly can expound on that a bit more, but we think it's important just to increase communication and understanding of tools that are already in existence. We also thought that it would be helpful to train on bias, including uh, in that training all, all stakeholders uh, in the system, but particularly focusing on law enforcement, uh, correctional officers um, would be important to include in that as well. So we're not just talking about people who are on the, officers who are on the street, but correctional officers who are in facilities um, overseeing uh, populations. Another topic that we thought would be helpful was to provide an overarching discussion of data uh, for example, what data elements would assist in identifying inequities? What data elements do we currently have and what do we need to obtain? So that we can really identify what inequities do we have in the criminal law system and to target those and then to be able to evaluate whether we're actually making progress through uh, data. The next we thought would be helpful is to discuss uh, the IRAS uh, pretrial tool. Um, Mary Kay and, and other uh, staff of court services have been working on just the refining of this tool. There's work in validating, in 
the validation process of this tool in different counties where it's being used. And uh, slowly we're getting reports back and the study seems to definitely evidence some positive movement with respect to inequities in pretrial release decisions and bail amounts. Um, and there's still more work to go, but we think it'd be helpful to, to just go over and share with this group, you know, what positive movement are we seeing? What questions are, are still unanswered or, or out there? And then what adjustments if it need to be made to actually achieve equity in this area? So those are the areas that we thought would be a good place to start. Steve, did you want to add anything? Yeah, uh, just um, currently myself, Sheriff Clark, Sheriff Reynolds, uh, we're working with Representative Steerwald. And really what we're trying to do is study the uh, process of decertification in Indiana. And, and the whole goal of that is to really address the problem with those career long um, officers that are moving from place to place to place. There's a reason for this. Um, nobody wants a, a bad cop out there and also kind of apply this over to corrections because that is a big uh, demanding position that with a lot of overturn. And what we're finding out is uh, some of the smaller departments, they probably don't do as thorough background checks as they should or a town marshal's office. They're just looking for that person to hire because they have the credentials and nobody's looking in their background. And what we want to do here at the Sheriff's Association is we really want to enhance and tighten up that process to make sure we are truly getting um, uh, uh, all the right applicants at the same time uh, as they're moving through their career that uh, if there is a complaint, uh, a criminal charge, that uh, we address it properly. Uh, currently, we use the, uh, uh, the Merit Board, which was established back in 1972. Their purpose is to hire, fire, demote, and promote. But one of the things we feel like we can do, uh, and we've uh, reached out to a Dr. Goldman, who's probably the top expert in this area of decertification um, out of St. Louis. Uh, he's done 40 years of work in it, and he pointed us towards um, Florida. Florida has probably got the model uh, legislation or process for the decertification um, to make sure uh, the process is good, not only nationally, but internationally. And we've had direct contact with them and their staff down at FDLA. Uh, got a lot of great information. Uh, one of the things that we would like to really push for uh, is, you know, to make sure there's a disposition, whether it's a complaint, uh, criminal charge, moral, ethical, anything like that that requires an investigation. Uh, currently, right now, sometimes an officer may resign before that investigation is complete. But what we want to do, as Florida is doing, is make sure there is a in disposition, whether they resign or not, or charges are filed uh, with that complaint charge or ethical or moral or interpretive, anything you can think of, that there's always a final disposition. And that record would follow that person through the National Decertification Index, which is one of the tools we spoke of to Bernice in the Black Caucus that is actually out there. That uh, That's where our post, which is the Law Enforcement Academy, <clears throat> they do do decertifications. And uh, that information is filled into that NDI um, software, which again is accessible to all police agencies, sheriffs, but more or less this, what I'm talking about is uh, really uh, creating a good um, piece of legislation that uh, really helps us to be very transparent with everything that happens through a career or an officer at the same time, address current training. Uh, me personally, uh, we're going to be looking into that um, with a couple of sheriffs and we've also got the uh, Director Horty from the Law Enforcement Board uh, engaged already, <coughs> excuse me, uh, simply because it's time for him to be a part of the talk. We basically did a lot of the heavy lifting to bring it to him. In our meeting, we, we've got full support. Now we got to talk with the board themselves. but. I think the end product when we're done is going to be very good for Indiana. You'll see a model as we'll lead the nation in a lot of this stuff. Well, Bernice and Steve, I, I want to express my appreciation again to both of you for really leading the effort uh, in, in these discussions and, and moving the ball forward in this important work. Uh, 
before we move to the next agenda item, are there any questions from council members for either Bernice or Steve? Yes, I have a question. Um, Steve, you mentioned that that currently some of this, um, uh, you know, some of this officer uh, uh, discipline is run through merit boards. Um, I've I've been attorney for police and fire merit boards for over twenty years. We don't really. Do you know how many like police merit boards we actually have in the state of Indiana? Um, I mean, not. There aren't that many. Well, I can speak on behalf of the sheriffs. Uh, there's 92 simply because they're part of their job is also the pension. And there's 92 uh, pension plans out there that are, um, um, can't think of the name of the exact The name. sheriffs, yeah, but, right. Yeah, but there are 92 uh, mayor boards under the sheriffs, yes. Oh, Every county but do you them. have any idea how that, uh, uh, works with cities and towns? Yeah, it's kind of a combination because I used to be a city police officer. Uh, if you're probably incorporated a town that um, you have a um, board of works that might, uh, that you may have a police commission actually named. Uh, then you also have towns that may have a board of works that hires and fires. Uh, so, you know, you're gonna have a, uh, probably a small list of how municipalities do things and whether they're based on being incorporated or not incorporated, but they should all have that in place. Uh, but speaking specifically on the sheriffs, we, every county has a mayor board of five members. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Okay. Well, very well. Uh, thank you again. And, and moving uh, to second part of the work that was completed by the quick response group. There are two items uh, for discussion and uh, vote today. The first is a legislative proposal by IPAC uh, concerning driving while suspended. And I would ask for a report out uh, for IPAC Executive Director, Chris Naylor. Chris. Thank you, Justice Goff. Uh, there are way too many Hoosiers who have their driver's license suspended. And so over the course of the last year, uh, IPAC has been working closely with a number of uh, stakeholders uh, in this area to figure out how can we address this uh, in a comprehensive package. And I think it was the last meeting, uh, Jay Chaudhry suggested that we meet with uh, legal services. And, and we did that. We had really good conversations with legal services and they're very pleased uh, with, with how this uh, has progressed. Uh, but, you know, the big picture, there are, about, there are over 300,000 Hoosiers who have their driver's license suspended. Uh, you know, many of those, there are multiple suspensions because we have close to a million suspensions uh, for 300,000 Hoosiers. So 80% of these suspensions deal with, uh, number one, failing to pay a traffic ticket. Number two, failing to appear in court on a traffic ticket. And number three, uh, failing to have insurance. So we've got a, we've developed language that would uh, focus primarily on these three areas. And uh, there's been an interim uh, study committee on roads and transportations uh, chaired by Representative Sullivan. Uh, I think the first meeting was September 10th and uh, the proposals were, were kind of rolled out there. And uh, uh, I think it was well received. I think Representative Sullivan uh, may hold the initiative open for questions maybe for the final uh, interim study committee. Uh, we've been uh, talking with a number of uh, legislators to share the ideas and, and gain support, but uh, it's been a really good collective ef effort with uh, public defenders, uh, Supreme Court, Office of Court Services, uh, the BMV, uh, Legal Services, and others. Uh, so we're, we're, you know, it's it's something that's need to, it's it should have been addressed uh, some time ago, but it's it's complex, and we want to make sure that we address it the right way. So. Uh, we're, we're very pleased with uh, the progress that's been made. Thank you, Chris. Are there any questions uh, for Chris from uh, council members? Yeah, do, do you have an outline, Chris, or some like major concepts that you could share with us yet? Yeah, I, and in fact, I mean, I could send you the draft language too. I could send that out to the group, but uh, some of the highlights you know, for a failure to appear in your traffic ticket, 
we would just eliminate any suspensions dealing with that. And that would be a fine, that would be a fine only. Uh, for failing, failing to pay a traffic ticket, there would be like a 30 day grace period after notice is made to give that person the opportunity to pay before a uh, suspension kicks in. Uh, on the insurance piece, you know, it, we want to provide that once someone shows that they have insurance, that the suspension can be re removed at that time. And on all these issues, there's suspensions stacked on suspensions, which creates this impossible hurdle so we want to re remove that because once we reduce these suspensions for the failing failure to pay a ticket, failure to show up and court on your traffic ticket, that will reduce the number of misdemeanors because that's, you know, what I've talked about aren't criminal offenses. It's after you get the suspension and you drive, that, that's when the misdemeanor offense comes in. And in 2019, this driving while suspended was the number one criminal charge filed in the state, unfortunately, about 26,000. Uh, so we, we think that number will come down dramatically and will help people be able to get to work, you know, be able to take kids to daycare or school, be able to go to the grocery store without looking over their shoulder, wonder, wondering whether or not they're uh, gonna get stopped with a suspended license. So uh, again, it's it's very technical, but I'm, I'm happy to, to send the, uh, the draft language out to the group. Thank you, Chris. Um, without uh, having the specific language, would it make sense then that we uh, table the further discussion until next month uh, so that we could ask for uh, some expression of support if, if that's indeed what you'd like to have from the group? Would that, uh, would that make sense? I think that makes complete sense. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, this is Randy Fry. Chris, um, I would really like to work on this. We've been uh, having some of the similar conversations as well as I'm on the Roads and Transportation Committee and I heard the testimony. The only thing I would caution the group is uh, sessions come in like a freight train and uh, we have to get legislation uh, out there to LSA to draft it. So uh, I suppose we can wait till October, but uh, the longer you wait, the harder it is to get it drafted properly and, and the harder it is to get it passed during session. But I would love to be a part of the discussion. Thank you, Representative Fry. Thank you. Well, I, I know that when we discussed this last meeting, uh, there was general consensus that this was a good idea, and I, I think that you'll have some support. But uh, yeah, we'd appreciate, uh, Chris, if we could get the language in advance of the next meeting and uh, hopefully move, move this project along. Are there any, uh, any further questions for Chris before we move on to the next item? Uh, well, next on the agenda uh, is uh, proposed amendments uh, to uh, Indiana Code 35338, 3.8 by Senator Italian. Senator? Yes. Um, so we've had a few meetings. We've had a few meetings uh, with uh, Bernice and with Chris. And then um, we gave some suggestions. And then we also had a meeting with Andy uh, Hedges from LSA um, to get a draft of this that does not include the words presumption uh, of, of bail. Um, and we do have a draft. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the way it was drafted, um, Andy kind of uh, jettisoned the entire bail statute repeal the old one and put in a new one, which makes it extremely difficult to track the changes. So we've asked him to, to kind of go back, undo some of that, um, and so that we can figure out exactly the words that are being changed. Um, we're, that's where I am right now. And Bernice, I know you've seen this draft. Uh, I, I think your comments are the same as mine. It's really hard to figure out just exactly what's been changed. Okay. Um, 
Is there, is there any further discussion then about the group? I understand, Senator, that uh, you, you all are moving along on this and you'd just like to have a little bit of time to come to some consensus on what end product is presented to the group? Uh, yes, please. I think if we can, if we can, if we can keep the old statute, not do a repeal, just track the changes, uh, and then I can get them over to Chris. Great. Um, any objection then to just tabling this discussion until uh, next month? Justice Goff, I, I guess I have a question. So there was a, a, a version that was included in the materials. Is that, um, Senator, that version completely off the, the table and there, that something new is coming or, because I've got a couple of reservations about uh, the version that was sent and I don't, I don't know if you'd be interested in hearing that or. Well, I'd love to hear that, but frankly, I don't know what version was sent okay. with the materials. Um, I, I Justice Scott, I could clarify. I'm sorry, Senator Italian, I can clarify. I think that was the aversion that was filed last year. Oh, okay. All right. 2020 language. All right. So that's been that's been some time ago. All right. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, I'd love to hear uh, your issues with that and see if they're the same ones that that Chris had. Well, I think the one thing is I know there's some reference to a preponderance of the evidence standard in um, and in other bail statutes we have a clear and convincing evidence standard um, so it appears to me to be a different standard for misdemeanors than for if that's what we're I think that's very confusing um, to practitioners the other thing is um, and, and I I think where we're going with this is to um, have more misdemeanors presumptively released. Is that, I think, where, where the objective of the legislation? That's the objective of the legislation, but I'm not allowed to use that word. Okay. <laughs> so the, with the language from the prior version, it seemed to um, contemplate a hearing um, and then a, a decision that was made after that um, to, you know, whether, if you're going to hold them or not. And I think that I just didn't, I didn't understand how that would work in the, in the um, real world because most misdemeanors, most misdemeanor offenses are warrantless arrests. And so releases typically occur on warrantless arrests based on a bail schedule. Um, and um, bond is set usually, um, uh, uh, you know, either they're bailing out or um, somebody's calling a judge at some point in the process and, and asking for a finding of probable cause and a finding of a bail. You don't, a lot of those don't find their way to a hearing until um, further on in the process. So I don't know that that's going to get us where we're trying to go. Um, and I, I don't have a suggestion in terms of, uh, of where, where to go. I know a lot of jurisdictions have gone to um, a, a um, recognizance release uh, of, of misdemeanors um, based upon classes of charges or some even, I think, all misdemeanors. But I guess I, I didn't, it was unclear to me how, the, how this would, would work in the, in the real world based upon the prior version. And maybe that's some of the things that are being worked on um, now. Well, I think that one of, the, one of the problems is that not all courts um, operate equally. And that in some places, uh, some places are more, uh, if I use the word progressive than others. And, um, and you know, there are some jails that have a lot of pretrial detainees and part of the reason is because they either haven't had their bail set or there's or it's too much and they can't afford it so uh, that's what I'm really trying to reach um, are not the courts that are already doing it but the courts that aren't is that fair Bernice yes well, I think this is a great conversation. Uh, what, what I would like to propose, my recollection from our earlier discussion was that we had assigned um, 
a, a, a small group to take a, a close look at the proposed legislation with the hopes of coming to some consensus on, uh, on a, a proposal that uh, could have the support of the, the council. And um, I would like to request that the group uh, continue that discussion with a goal towards uh, presenting a product for next month's meeting. And um, with Judge Spitzer expressing you know, his uh, thoughts and concerns, I would only uh, put out to the group that he has uh, been tasked by uh, Chief Justice as uh, chairing the pretrial committee, uh, the newly formed pretrial committee, uh, and, and his, his input uh, was probably gonna be helpful uh, towards, towards uh, meeting that end. And so, Mark, if uh, you have an interest and you have the ability, um, I, I would ask if, if the group is willing to hear from you, that I think that that input might be very helpful. And if, uh, yeah, if we can offer any assistance in staffing, you, you'll have it. Uh, but uh, the, the goal, of course, is to come uh, forward with some language that everyone is as comfortable with as they can be. And then we can make a decision as a group as to whether or not you know, we can we can support the proposal going forward so okay uh, all right yeah that's great and do we have a date for october we do yeah the the meeting uh in october will take place on october 28th from one to three okay all right so um we'll get together before then and and judge spitzer will will contact you to be a part of that and i will get you also uh, a draft as soon as I get it back. I'd love to be in the loop. And if Thank it you. would, um, mm -hmm. uh, if you wouldn't mind as well, when I get in the loop, I'd, I'd love to have the ability to share whatever we have with my committee members as well. And I can do that, you know, by email or whatever. Um, it, the, the committee is made up of a lot of practitioners. And so they um, will have some insights that I might not have as well. And so, um, uh, um, if I could do that too, um, Senator, I'd, I'd love to help in that process. All right. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Um, I'm going to move on then to the next agenda item. I've gotten some messages from April as to time commitments by council members, and there was a request uh, for a first uh, report out to go a little bit out of order, uh, and so I, I'm going to grant that request and ask if we could have... Um, Oh, excuse me. No. Well, let me just put this first. Uh, the item I got earlier was uh, a request for Steve Luce needing to get off the call. Uh, so, is Steve, if that's still the case, uh, I guess I would call you in advance of the, the next agenda item. Do you need to get off at 2.30? If, if, if that's the case, please feel free to make your report out now uh, yep. before we hear about the budget. Okay, thank you, Justice Goff. A um, couple things I'll report on is I think everybody wants to uh, know about the jail data project. It is moving along. The RFP has been um, issued. Uh, we're, the uh, questions are out there. They're getting responses back. Um, I do believe at the end of October to early November, a vendor will be picked. Uh, um, so that's going to be exciting. And one thing I keep telling everybody, and I might be repeating myself, but you know, this, this is going to be an all 92 JMS systems coming to a hub in the state of Indiana. It's our data, we own it. So let's really think about what we wanna collect uh, and, and build this thing to where we can work uh, smarter, not harder, and maybe re redirect money to different places when we see trends happening. So um, hopefully that thing will be complete within two years. And I asked for that timeline simply because that's when new sheriffs come in. So it'd be nice to have that already operating and some sheriffs uh, understand um, the importance of having that. So uh, the IU jail study will continue with that. Um, and maybe Jay and Doug can expand on this, but we had a really good mental health meeting at the government center. Justice Golf was there. It was really about the forensic commitments and community restoration. Um, I'm going to plan to put a trip together to go down to Nashville, Tennessee, the sheriff down there, Sheriff Hall, has just built a behavioral center for diversion. And I would also, um, I'm going to have Sheriff Skinner from Delaware County stay in touch with us too, because their new jail is gonna also have a diversion center also. And I think it could be a model we could copy throughout Indiana. 
Um, I've already touched up on the law enforcement legislation, um, what we're trying to do with decertification and training. Um, one thing I would ask Department of Corrections to keep in mind, uh, because 2020 has been really uh, um, up and down with our DOC numbers, uh, when you go to do your annual two-year review on uh, per diems for the sheriffs, they get paid one time a year on the level sixes. Keep that in mind so it doesn't skew your data. Um, also, uh, working on a small group with uh, Mary Kay, I believe it's Mary Kay, uh, we're involved in a lot um, on court security. Uh, the ISA received a uh, MAT grant um, and right now we have 12 counties that are uh, participating. Uh, we're early in the stages there. Uh, that's very, uh, uh, a good, great opportunities, not just for MAT, but uh, for counseling services, uh, those on methamphetamine. It covers a lot of different things, but we're really focusing on the types of MAT we can do in the jail. Um, our um, jail population small group committee um, I've got, I think, six of my back, which I'll get those to Mary Kay. Um, also, would like to have a uh, maybe information from uh, Wendy McNamara, if she could send out the information on the mental health um, testifying, because uh, my dates were different than what her October 6th was, and I just want to make sure we're on the same page there. Uh, Sheriff Reynolds will want to also participate there. And the last thing I want to do is, you know, let you know, we are doing a grant through the ISA, through our Burn JAG Criminal Justice, um, which is the Indiana Sheriff's Association Sheriff's Standardization Policy and Procedures. What they, what we're doing is working with a company called Lexapol. They are working with uh, many of the sheriff's offices through this grant to one of the areas that we recognize is difficult for sheriffs to consistently have because we're term limited, one of three states is, some of them never get their policies, procedures correct, or they're always ongoing, which is not good for a sheriff when he steps in the office. So this grant will allow them to have the startup cost with Lexapol to start creating standard legal policies, procedures, whether it's on the law enforcement side, a little bit on the jail side. For example, they'll have a policy, if they have body-worn cameras, it will match our state law and answer a lot of those questions that we have to answer or don't know about because this is a problem here in Indiana because mainly, as I said, um, they're term limited. They, uh, they hit the ground running, leave the ground running, and never some of the small, medium sheriff's offices just don't have the resources to uh, pay for someone to do their policies, procedures like the large ones. So I think that was a very timely grant because we started that in um, January. And I'd say right now over half the sheriff's offices are involved in doing this. So that is my update. Thank you. Thank you as always, Steve, for uh, everything you do. Um, so I, I next move on to what was item five on the agenda. And that is a member discussion for uh, budget fiscal year 2022 to 2023, uh, budget forecast and, and local input. And for uh, facilitation of the discussion, I would call upon Senator, Senator Talion again, and also uh, Kirsten Haney. Senator? Well, unfortunately, uh, we were supposed to have a, a revenue forecast uh, at the last budget committee meeting, which was about 10 days ago. Um, the Revenue Forecast Committee decided that it would be too risky, basically, to do a forecast uh, because so many of the, um, of the inputs that they use to make their forecast uh, have been so volatile over the last couple of months that they thought it would be uh, more harm than good to do the forecast. So we don't have a budget forecast or a revenue forecast uh, for next year. Uh, what I can tell you is a couple of things. Um, first of all, the, um, the, uh, the shortfall that we experienced at the closeout of 2020, due to the fact that we, um, that we uh, did an extension on when the taxes were due, um, so 
whatever we lost in 2020 on the on the on the income tax, we got it back. Um, so we're back to uh, you know you'll see a revenue uh, report recently that shows we're up 900 million dollars. Well, that was the same 900 million that we were short the last time. So right now we're even. Um, the Another thing that we found out is that uh, there may be some federal guidance that allows um, money to be used from CARES money for law enforcement, uh, sheriffs, police, first responders of all kinds that may put some money back into the system. Unfortunately, we got two sets of guidance, one from uh, the inspector general and one from treasury and they said two different things so we don't have an answer on that but if we have an answer on if we get the answer that we're expecting we may be able to put about five to six hundred million dollars into the budget for law enforcement and first responder related activities um, and I would assume that would also include some of the court activities um, that we've got going with like uh, the eviction uh, uh, response, you know, settlement conference. Um, that's about all I have that I know. Everything else that I have is just a guess. So just to build on that, um, we did receive updated guidance from Office of Inspector General and Treasury, and they're very much married, unlike they were before. So legal staff are currently going through all of that, but I don't want to give uh, an official answer, but it does look like it, it's hopeful to get the public safety salaries using reimbursed through the CRF funds. Well, that's um, great news. Yeah, oh, that's huge news. Um, so we're still working through that. Again, the guidance to come. Um, it's my understanding it is just public safety salaries, but again, we're still going through the guidance. So there might be some more lenience on how that can be applied to different salaries that aren't just public safety. Um, also, Senator Italian said we didn't have a September revenue forecast, so the next one will be in December, which is right there at the same time when uh, governor's recommended budget comes out just a few weeks later. So um, for now, it's just the process of budgets have been submitted. We're going through all of them, meeting with agencies to discuss them, and, and then we'll be building a budget after that, truly. Uh, just Dave Bauer, just to follow up on that quickly, Senator Chayan kind of stole my report about the, uh, the new information that came out Monday. And so we do expect the, we hope that the state will pass down that authority to locals as, as well to use for public safety salaries, um, which would include sheriff deputies, jailers, 911 directors. It, it does include some public health officers, but it does really make that money much more flexible. And it's really a substantive change from the original guidance that came out back in April. So very welcome news and looking forward to a memo from OMB relatively soon to, to clarify all that. So. Thank you. Um, is there anything else uh, from any members of the council? Well, uh, Senator Kirsten, I wanna thank both of you for keeping us up to speed to the extent that you possibly can on all of this. It's very helpful. Uh, as our various agencies plan and, and try to uh, maintain day-to-day -day operations through very challenging times. And Dave, I also want to thank you for uh, keeping us updated on, on these subjects throughout our, our earlier uh, calls. So um, just really appreciative of it, and we look forward to uh, hearing from all of you in the future. I, I'm next going to move on to agenda item six, which is member reports. And uh, for our first report, I'm going to call on Adam McQueen for a report from the Probation Office's Professional Association of Indiana. Adam? Uh, thank you, Justice Goff. Um, just very briefly, um, the Probation Officers Professional Association of Indiana is fresh off the heels of a, uh, a training where we were able to provide six evidence-based um, 
training hours to um, almost 450 community supervision officers across the state. Um, and, and that continues to be our focus to uh, seek out opportunities to continue to provide those, those um, training opportunities. And that's all I have, Justice. Thank you, Adam. I next call on Ralph Watson, permanent designee for Ward Buyers to give a report out on behalf of the Association of Community Corrections Act Counties. Ralph. Thank you, Justice Goff. Uh, as Adam said, uh, our association is also looking to, uh, for ways in which we can provide some training opportunities to our staff, to our uh, various counties um, through electronically. Uh, since we were unable to have our uh, large fall conference that we have uh, for a uh, county statewide. And the other information, the other activity that we have is the end of our calendar year, 2020 calendar year, and uh, is approaching with the, and the grant period is for 2020. So we're uh, anxiously awaiting the IDOC announcement for the calendar year 2021 annual grant awards. And I know that's uh, something that there's been a lot of discussion among our um, association members. And that's the report I have. Thank you, Ralph. We might hear a little bit about that uh, at this meeting. Uh, and uh, for our next report, I would call on Devin McDonald uh, for a report out on behalf of the Criminal Justice Institute. Devin? Thank you, Justice Goff. Uh, I don't really have much. As Steve Luce alluded to earlier, we're continuing to work on the, the data project and the victim notification project. Um, it is moving along and, and we're nearing the end uh, and getting to where we're going to be awarding those contracts, like he, like he said. Um, also, on the related to the COVID front, we've, we've had several applications. I think we're nearing 20 or so applications now for COVID relief to the counties for a lot of public safety related issues, uh, courthouse. Uh, issues, jail, uh, PPE, things like that. So it'll be in, pretty interesting um, once this comes to an end to find out really how all this, if we can get some information on how all these funds are being used from a public safety perspective, I think that'd be good information moving forward um, that we may be able to use to develop some policy and some, maybe some best practices. So uh, beyond that, um, it's starting work on our uh, annual criminal code report. Uh, which we do in collaboration with this committee, JRAC committee as well, on, on December 1st. So continue uh, starting work on that, making data requests and um, putting some virtual focus groups together for that as well. But other than that, that's about all I have for right now. Thank you. Thank you for that report, Devin. Uh, next call again on Mary Kay Hudson for a report out on behalf of the Office of Judicial Administration. Mary Kay. Um, thank you, Justice Goff. Um, our staff continues to work with local jurisdictions in certifying the pretrial services programs and the problem solving courts. Um, we are hosting the Juvenile Detention Alternatives Initiatives Intersight Conference uh, coming up this first week of October. Um, and we are going to be working with some new counties on JDAI, including Lawrence County, who is going to be fully implementing the JDAI principles. We're really excited about that. Um, Office of Court Services is continuing its partnership with the Division of Mental Health and Addiction. We recently received notice from DMHA that we will be able to work with them on providing a third year of grant funding under the statewide opioid response grant to provide assistance to local criminal justice systems in providing access to screening, referral, and treatment for opioid use and other substance use disorder. So this will be um, year three of each county being eligible for $60,000 to implement screening, referral, and treatment services um, across decision points in the criminal justice system. So we're very grateful to Jay and his team at DMHA for allowing us um, to work with them on this. Uh, we just awarded our second round of grants under that funding um, with our partnership with DMHA. And counties are using those funds for service and referral in jails. They're using them for pretrial services and other interventions across the system. So um, it's been able to bring some resources to the communities that would have otherwise not been available. So we're very grateful for that. And then I need to provide uh, one clarification. Senator Talion, you asked if the landlord tenant settlement conferences were uh, able to be facilitated by law students. And uh, Michelle Goodman reminded me that we are working with the, the Notre Dame um, Legal School Law School Clinic with Professor Judith Fox. Um, and we'll be working with her to be able to provide supervision 
for law students um, to serve in that capacity uh, once, and that'll be up and running and available in the near future. And that is all my report, Justice Goff. Thank you, Mary Kay. I next call on uh, Chris Blessinger, permanent designee of Commissioner Rob Carter for a report out from the Indiana Department of Corrections. Chris? Thank you, Justice Goff. Um, so yeah, I am gonna share some information today uh, regarding the community corrections grants. So I know that it has took a, a little bit longer than normal, but um, as you know, with the circumstances and uh, you know, questions centered around the budgets and just due to the challenging time that we're in, uh, we were just able to just kind of figure things out this week. So for the community corrections grants, uh, for the first six months of January through June of 2021, we will do a contract exten extension for those six months. So community corrections staff will be reaching out to the counties and agencies to just do a six month extension on the current contract that you guys, that, that the agencies have and just continue with operations. Um, within the next couple of weeks, uh, you know, our staff, uh, community corrections staff will be reaching out to the agencies in uh, different counties with, you know, specific instructions on what will need to be done. And, and we know and understand that we need to get to work on the contracts, contract extensions quickly so that, um, you know, uh, the advisory boards can get those and get signatures. Uh, we, we understand the urgency, you know, and how that can sometimes take a little bit of time. So we will definitely get to working on that. Um, if the counties have any kind of specific questions, uh, they can work directly with, with us. For, please feel free to reach out. Um, you know, and we thank everybody for being patient on that. Um, the other, uh, well, and then after we find out more about, um, you know, budgets and, you know, where we're at, you know, with budget cuts or anything for um, the next fiscal year, we'll, we'll, you know, update everybody as we find out information. Um, the other thing I wanted to share today, too, that's some exciting news for us uh, as an agency is that we did also, we created a position um, that is going to be a Deputy Commissioner of Diversity and Development. Uh, so uh, that person is going to be Angela Sutton. I don't know if any of you uh, recognize, or recognize that name. She was the Executive Director for the Division of Youth Services. Um, so uh, with this new created position, we'll be reviewing hiring practices, reviewing training curriculum. She's going to be looking at trends and, you know, like under discipline, uh, looking at culture surveys and results to those, looking at exit surveys, um, just, just going to be doing a lot of stuff. So uh, just kind of wanted to share that news because I think that's pretty exciting for our agency. But other than that, that's all I have to report today. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, thank you again also for your assistance with uh, the small group on uh, congestion in the jails. Really appreciate it. And your, your plan was re well received by the Judicial Conference Board of Directors. Oh, great. Thank you. Justice uh, Goff, could I ask Chris a question? Yes, please. Um, Chris, uh, Mark Spitzer. Um, I have, uh, have been having some conversations with some of my colleagues about connectivity with, with uh, Department of Correction, specifically with um, using Zoom with Department of Correction. And I think now there's a process where we can do that through a, your Cisco, but it's a pretty complicated process. Um, and so, I mean, I think I'd like to see, and I think a lot of my colleagues would would as well, just have the ability to just, you know, have a direct Zoom connection with um, uh, the facility so that we could, um, you know, um, ha hold video hearings. Um, and the process is pretty complicated now. And as a result, I think a lot of my colleagues are just not using it. And, okay. and maybe that's increasing transports. Um, and so I'm wondering if there's okay. some accommodation that could be made to make that process more streamlined. Sure, I'll absolutely look into that and get, uh, get you some additional information. 
Um, unfortunately, I'm not the expert on tech, so oh, I, I will yeah. definitely yeah, look either, into that for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I will absolutely look into that for you and get uh, get some additional get some information out. Yeah. And that's actually kind of the point, Chris, is that if, if the process is too complicated, then um, us judges aren't going to use it. Um, and so simplifying it as soon as po as easy as possible so that us mere mortals can, uh, um, can, can use the technology that, that, you know, that, that really enhances its use. Okay, I will see what, uh, what we can do to make that process easier for sure. Great, thank you. Chris, uh, just to follow up on that, if we have a, a follow-up meeting to that small group, I'd be happy to take whatever information you have and make sure it gets out to the, the trial bench. For okay. all of the council members, I would just tell you, you know, one of the things I value about this format is we're able to share and report out on the work of the agencies that we all represent. And the Supreme Court uh, provided Zoom licenses to, to basically all of the trial courts and did so in an effort to continue operations throughout the pandemic. And so that format is really the format that our trial bench has become very familiar with and uh, the ability to communicate that way among our justice partners would probably be something that would, uh, mm -hmm. would be helpful and, and, and would increase efficiency. So thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I next call for a report out from Jay Chaudhry on behalf of the Division of Mental Health and Addiction. Jay, are you able to hear me? Yes, Mr. Goff, I can hear you. I'm driving, so. I, I knew uh, you were, so thank you. Please. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, not a whole lot to, to report here other than uh, the Recovery Works report uh, is on track and should be ready at some point in October. Um, our evaluator was able to, I think, uh, figure out some of it. You know, I, I don't quite understand that whole world, but I, you know, I think he was able to figure out some, some. I'm just gonna call it magic uh, to uh, be able to more accurately get a picture of what recidivism means. Not so, not just return to jail, but actually like any kind of arrest data as well. And so, I think it should paint a much more accurate picture of the effect Recovery Works is having on recidivism. So we're excited about that. Uh, and so stay tuned and uh, we'll you know, share that when it's appropriate. Um, the other thing I would add is just to echo what Steve Luce said about uh, the meeting we had with uh, everybody, Justice Goff and Doug and, and all the sheriffs. I thought it was just a, a great uh, open and collaborative dialogue. And so we're looking forward to building off of that. That's all I have. Thank you, Jay. Appreciate it. Um, next, I'd call for a report out from Chris Naylor on behalf of the Indiana Prosecuting Attorneys Council. Thank you, Justice Goff. Um, you know, this is interim study season, and a couple of weeks ago, the uh, <clears throat> Courts and Criminal Code Interim Study Committee, chaired by Representative McNamara, had a topic on pretrial, and a couple of things from that meeting, uh, Judge Decoff and uh, Troy Hatfield, both from Monroe County did a good job of uh, talking about pretrial uh, from the local perspective and they had some uh, important data to share. Um, I also testified and just talked about a broad overview of uh, Criminal Rule 26 and pretrial, kind of the history, uh, but I also took the opportunity to, to make a pitch for some initiatives that JREC has uh, supported, you know, highlighting the importance of uh, pretrial officers, uh, the, importance, the importance of expanding a technical assistance on evidence-based decision making in general, and then also uh, the importance of the pilot program uh, providing money for uh, uh, recovery works money for, for misdemeanor offenses. So <clears throat> just wanted to report back to the group on that. Um, jury trials have, have picked up. Uh, some uh, counties have been quicker to transition uh, than others, uh, but to, from what we've heard, I haven't heard of any COVID spread as a result of, of jury trials. Uh, Tippecanoe County in particular has been very active with uh, I think 12 jury trials as of a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but again, not all counties are back to their normal trial schedule. Uh, one negative has been just uh, more no-shows by, by the jury pool than normal. And I guess that's, that's to be expected. Uh, but overall, it sounds like uh, uh, jury trials have been held in a safe manner. 
Uh, finally, uh, just this week, IPAC uh, sponsored uh, some training uh, by Doug Marlowe, who is uh, uh, in the leadership of the uh, National Association of Court Professionals. And uh, we were able to do this uh, through funding from DMHA. So we're appreciative of, of that funding from DMHA. But it was a multidisciplinary training focused on uh, the impact of addiction on the human brain, uh, how to best treat addiction, and how to best use uh, medication-assisted treatment in the uh, justice system. Uh, also included uh, uh, topics of uh, criminogenic risk and substance use disorder. Uh, also, uh, the issue of, of uh, women with children and pregnant women and substance use disorder. So a really valuable training. Uh, and again, we, we appreciate uh, the funding opportunity from DMHA. Thank you for that report, Chris. I next call uh, again on Bernice Corley for a report out on behalf of the Public Defender Council. Bernice. Justice Kopp, I believe that she had to um, hop off of the call. Okay, sure. Uh, in that case, I'd call on Doug Hunsinger for a report out on behalf of the Office of Governor Holcomb. Yeah, thank you. Um, as Steve mentioned, uh, we had a really productive meeting with the Sheriff's Association, and I want to thank Justice Goff for attending that meeting and talking about some of the long-term plans that uh, this group is working on. Um, our hope is that we'll provide some relief uh, regarding inmates with mental health issues, um, and and this really, like I said, this our discussion really dovetails nicely with the mapping project, uh, and our hope is is that we can work toward both. Uh, a near-term and a long-term um, solution and reduce wait times that, uh, that we have at our facilities right now um, and, and, and also those wait lists that, uh, that surround um, the issue. So um, more coming on that, we are uh, very close on finding some funding solutions. And once we have those, uh, we'll, we'll be circling back with um, uh, both the Sheriff's Association and, uh, and you, Justice Goff, to, to continue that conversation moving forward. Great. I certainly look forward to it. It was a, it was a, it was a good meeting. A yeah. um, next call on leadership from the House Court and Criminal Code Committee. First, uh, I'd ask for a report out from Chair Representative Wendy McNamara, and then uh, also a report out uh, from Representative Reagan Hatcher as Ranking Minority Member. Representative McNamara. Hello. Uh, it's been a busy few weeks. Um, the first committee we had, interim study committee we had, uh, looked at um, the definition of consent uh, and rape and looked at other states and how they're dealing with health and safety issues in relationship to that. Uh, so far we've discussed um, 1006 um, and in, from the 2014-2015 legislation. Uh, we've looked at pretrial, um, criminal behavior, um, medical treatment and health, and implementation and sentencing. Uh, a lot of the members on this uh, call have um, participated in the conversations there. Uh, I forwarded the agenda for the 6th um, to all of you uh, in an email. If you want to um, testify on any one of those topics. It's kind of a follow-up day. Uh, just let me know. We'll probably limit it testimony just depend on how, long, how many people sign up, but definitely going to have a few more talk about mental health and treatment um, that didn't have the opportunity. And I do know the Sheriff's Association wanted to speak um, that day as well. We're going to start at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, the agenda says 11, but we're switching it up to 10 o'clock in the morning on the 6th. Um, a little bit of side note in another quest that I've been on for the last two and a half years is juvenile justice um, and the discussion around uh, the juvenile code. Uh, next Wednesday we'll convene the first meeting of the juvenile justice uh, task force that um, will have a review of our juvenile code uh, from the CSG which is the Council of State Governments uh, the committee is about 35 to 40 people um, from all over the state. Uh, it's just a large group of people, but everybody with a vested interest in juveniles. Um, 
what our hope is, is they're going to look for um, stakeholders in every county in the state of Indiana uh, to give their input on um, every question from how they define recidivism to uh, what their current system looks like in data collection for juveniles. Uh, but it's a good good group of people, um, myself and uh, Senator Kreider, the co-chairs, and then uh, Julie Whitman's actually kind of warehousing everything and conducting all that. So, um, like I said, on the 6th, we're going to finish up 10.06 and, and basically do a wrap up. So if anybody has any information they want to give that day, and then in the afternoon will be a discussion on fraud. And that's it. Thank you very much, Representative McNamara, and really appreciate your participation uh, throughout and keeping us up to speed. Thank you. No problem. R Representative Hatcher. April, uh, did we lose Representative Hatcher? I was reviewing the list and it looks like she may have had to hop off as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, in that case, I would next call for a report out from the Senate Corrections and Criminal Law Committee. Uh, I'd first ask for a report out from uh, Senator Young if he's on the call. And if he's not, I would ask uh, for a report out from Senator Talion as the ranking minority member. Um, I don't think Senator Young is on the call. I didn't see him. Um, I don't have a lot to report uh, myself from the Senate committee. Uh, I have been attending um, Representative McNamara's meetings. Uh, so I expect that, you know, we will do whatever that group um, recommends. Uh, I am also working on a couple of items with Bernice on some juvenile justice issues. But other than that, I, I don't have a report from the Senate. I'm not the chair. Well, Senator Talion, uh, regardless, I, I also wanna echo the sentiments I just made Representative McNamara. It's so helpful to us and staff to have your participation like this and to understand uh, what's been important to you in, in your branch and so that we can share uh, the information and the work that we're trying to accomplish in, in, in our branch. Uh, so thank you. Next call for a report out uh, from Mark Rutherford on behalf of the Public Defender Commission. Thank you, Justice Goff. Um, if nothing else, the commission and my the members uh, are willing to take stands that may seem unusual. We had a meeting on Wednesday right, uh, afternoon and despite the, the situation with the state's budget, as we analyzed it, we were very concerned about it. Just so everybody knows that we basically passed through money allocated by the legislature to the counties. And we were looking at what would be needed to prevent us from cutting the disbursements to the counties. And uh, our, our analysis in it is that we would need a $2.9 million a year increase. That's kind of, uh, seems like a lot, but we're worried based on how we did projections that there could be a potential cut in public defender reimbursements of 9% if we don't have the increase. Uh, we have more counties wanting to be in, uh, some more costs, et cetera. We're still figuring out how COVID relates to everything, but uh, the, we're gonna need another quarter to see what that, how that all does with anything. But we're worried about a 15% uh, base budget reduction, that the cut would be 25% in reimbursements uh, to the counties. Um, and you know, th these are, there are a lot of factors in it. Um, if there's some money left in the uh, non-reverting PD fund at the end of the fiscal year, that goes into the next year. That could affect these to some uh, extent, but we're worried about that. We don't want that to happen, but we've done a lot of an analysis over the years, a lot of statistical analysis with the records that are there, um, we're getting better at it. State's getting better at it. The counties are getting better at putting information together. And we see in county, uh, uh, com uh, commission counties that are in the program that the 
out of home placements is an average 20 day shorter. And we figure that that's up to $5.8 million savings to DCS. We look at the Department of Correction and the sentences in commission counties, and they are 64 days shorter. You increase all the Department of Correction sentences by 64 days. Whether that happened or not, I don't know. But it probably would. There's something going on here with having commission counties with public defenders uh, being uh, reimbursed and the, the, uh, uh, the, the counties in the commission abiding by the standards we set. That's uh, up to 30 million if uh, in savings to the Department of Correction. And we also notice in county uh, commission counties that they have about a 12% less per capita jail population. So I don't know what the figure on that is, but I do know from the top of my head that that has to represent uh, significant savings to county budgets. So yes, we're, we're, we're aware of this in this situation, but we think that everybody when it comes to the Public Defender Commission should be looking at what the costs are in not uh, meeting what is needed in, by the county commission counties. And we're in a situation where unlike, uh, and this is not an attack on anybody, but this is an easy example. Um, can you cut not redoing or building a new road or not paving one and waiting another year to stretch that out? That's easier to do. Uh, having a public defender is a more immediate thing. It's harder to cut a budget uh, and not have bad effects. You might be able to delay some other things and some other budgets. And we know the legislature is going to have a tough, tough deal. Uh, all, of the, uh, all of you from the House of Representatives and Senate on the call, uh, I don't envy your, where you're at right now. It's going to be a tough year and we get it. Mark, I always appreciate hearing from you and uh, the, the benefits to those counties that participate in the system. Uh, next, ask for a report out from uh, Judge Spitzer again on behalf of the Indiana Judges Association. We did meet uh, virtually um, er earlier in the month and uh, two, really two primary things other than sort of the inside baseball stuff that associations typically do. Um, resuming court operations and so our uh, communications and, and um, resources related to um, uh, making sure that the courts are doing the business that, that um, comes before them and, and a lot of in a lot of t times that's in a different way than we did before and so sharing information how to creatively um, uh, do that um, has been one of the focus and then the other of course is um, as we start getting in, into legislation season just to keep an eye on on uh, legislation that's bubbling up um, uh, um, and, and might be addressed in the future. So that's really um, what, what our focus has been. Thank you, Judge. I'd next call for a report out from David Botorf on behalf of the Indiana Association of Counties. Dave? Did we lose Dave April? No, it appears as though he might need to unmute. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Hope you can hear me now. Um, yeah, we just, uh, we, we talked about what I was gonna discuss earlier, the new flexibility from the federal government guidance on the use of the CARES Act money. Um, you know, the governor's office, the state passed through $300 million to cities, towns, and counties. And uh, as of earlier this week, probably less than 20 million had actually been spent on uh, COVID related expenses be because the restrictions were pretty tight. But with this new flexibility, we certainly anticipate um, salaries being turned in for public safety officials. And uh, that will probably take up the remainder of that 300 million. And what that really does is uh, makes the, the existing money we've appropriated for salaries, it makes that much more flexible. And so as we move forward, uh, we'll definitely be advising counties that they should start to look at their 2022 budget because that's when we're gonna see the, the decrease in income taxes. So this is uh, welcome news from the feds. Again, we hope the state uh, passes through some similar interpretation to the locals and um, that'll really help out our budget situation. So uh, that's really all I had to report. And I'm gonna switch over to a uh, to the phone call now, I've got to get in my vehicle and drive someplace, but um, appreciate
appreciate the opportunity again to uh, be on this committee. Understood. And thank you, Dave. Thanks uh, for your invaluable service to the committee. It's really been helpful to hear from you. Um, and finally, I'd ask uh, Kirsten Haney if there's any further report out uh, on behalf of the State Budget Agency. Kirsten? Thanks, Justice Staff. Um, nothing really additional to add just regarding the budget process. We are right now meeting with every single agency to discuss the budget they submitted, any change packages they submitted to get a better understanding of what those are. We're doing those meetings in collaboration with the governor's office to make sure we're all on the same page and everyone's looped in. Um, and we really do appreciate the agencies putting budgets together. Um, it was quite a big reserve and that's definitely not an easy to put together. I mean, it's difficult in years where we have a 2% reserve. So this was definitely a challenge and we, we empathize with everyone in understanding that process. So um, we're in the process of, like I said, meeting with them, reviewing all of the budgets, and then we will um, have the governor's recommended budget out by uh, early January. But really that's everything, the major updates on our end. Well, thank you again, Kirsten. Um, I always try to remember to indicate that the report outs I'm calling uh, are for the benefit of anyone who might be viewing today's meeting made in order uh, that the agencies appear in the statute. And I, I didn't ask uh, ahead of time, but are there any questions that members of the council have uh, from any of the other uh, council members regarding the report outs? Well, hearing none, uh, thank you all again. And I'm going to move on then to our next agenda item. That is item seven. And it is a report on the evidence-based decision-making and an overview. Uh, in our earlier meetings, we had promised that we would provide such an overview uh, for all of our benefit, but especially those who might be new to JRAC. And uh, I'm gonna call on my friend, Judge Mark Spitzer, uh, to make that report out and, and assisting him today is a uh, wonderful staff person, Samantha Goodson. So Judge and Samantha, take it away. Thank you, Justice Goff. Um, so as, you, um, as uh, Justice Goff indicated, I have uh, Sam Goodson, um, who is the pretrial and evidence-based decision-making initiative coordinator. She has helped um, staff the uh, evidence-based decision-making uh, project and um, uh, she and I, and let's be honest, mostly she, um, put together a um, pre-trial or a, a PowerPoint kind of overview of the EBDM um, initiative, the framework, and kind of what is uh, involved with EBDM. And so um, she's going to uh, kind of walk uh, the members through what EBDM is and how it has been used. Um, the framework has been used um, both at the local and state level and how it um, is relevant to what we're trying to do in JRAC. So I'll let her start and then I'll jump in um, in annoying fashion periodically and, and add my two cents. Thank you very much, Judge, and thank you to the Council for giving me the opportunity to come and share this with you today. Um, so I'm going to try to go through a lot of information relatively quickly. Um, and the primary objective here is just to sort of give everybody on the council, particularly those who are um, newer to this project um, or have not historically had any um, interaction with the evidence-based decision-making initiative, um, just sort of some foundational information about what evidence-based decision-making is um, and some of the work that we've done so far in the state of Indiana. So I wanna start by talking about the framework. So, um, this is an initiative that, that grew out from the National Institute of Corrections, which is a federal bureau underneath the um, Federal Bureau of Prisons, I believe. They worked with um, some consulting firms as well as other partners to develop a framework for evidence-based decision-making. Um, this document is available if you go to the link that you see at the bottom of the PowerPoint slide. It's a long document and it's very comprehensive. So I think that the one of the most important things I think to communicate is that evidence-based decision-making is not a program. Um, it's a framework and it, it's really what, it's really how we as professionals organize ourselves to do our work um, and our systems and you know more about um, how we do our work than what we do and making sure that we're doing our work in collaborative, coordinated ways to improve outcomes by aligning practices with evidence and the research base. 
Um, so here's sort of just a, a statement about what evidence-based decision making is, and I've obviously highlighted some key words here. Um, you know, collaborative partnership, using research to guide our work, and focusing on our goals as a system of achieving safer communities and more effective use of tax dollars and fewer victims. The use of this framework helps, helps us ensure that we are being good stewards of tax dollars and that we are really achieving our mission um, and our, our um, obligation to our communities by ensuring that our system is collaborating and coordinating um, and implementing practices that are shown to work. So there's four principles that sort of underlie the EBDM framework. Um, I'm just gonna sort of hit on some of the major points of, of each principle. So the first is with regard to this idea of using evidence-based knowledge. So this really is sort of prompting us as professionals to look to research to what has been found to work in various criminal justice practices and interventions and making sure that when we are designing and implementing practices and programs and systems that we are relying on that evidence base. The second is regarding this idea of, of harm reduction. And in the context of evidence-based decision-making, harm reduction is really something to consider broadly. So we're considering the opportunities for reduced harm to victims, reduced harm to communities, and reduced harm even to offenders and other folks who come into contact with our criminal justice system. The third principle speaks to this this idea of achieving better outcomes when operating collaboratively. And this really means that we as systems need to be aligning our efforts and objectives um, to ensure that we are really having the collective impact that we can have, making sure that all of the things that are going on in our system are complementing each other, are not in conflict, even unintentionally, and are supporting the outcomes across the board. The final point um, is really about looking at data. And the way that I interpret this is, you know, there's, there's looking at the research base, which is those sort of research studies that, that are done, the things that we consider to be evidence-based practices. To me, this, this issue of data and evidence means looking locally at what can we see about our own system from the data that we are collecting to see whether or not we're having the outcomes we intend to, and if we aren't, knowing how to improve. Um, Judge Spitzer, I wonder if you have anything to share regarding Grant County's um, operationalization of these principles. Yeah, thanks, Sam. So um, we used our Community Corrections Advisory Board as sort of the body, the collaborative body to, um, to sort of operationalize this. And so we already had, and, and many counties have a Community Corrections Advisory Board already that statutorily has a lot of the um, of, of the players in the criminal justice system. We invited some additional people to the table as well. Um, and so that gets you to the collaborative part of this. You have everybody in the same room um, and they're, they're talking to each other. Um, the other point that we made is that second point with our, the people in our system is that every interaction within the justice system offers an opportunity to, cr to contribute to harm reduction. What that means is that if we're trying to get recidivism uh, accomplish rec recidivism reduction, that every interaction that any of us in the system have with an offender um, may contribute to um, recidivism reduction. Um, and uh, we, we talked about ways that, uh, that uh, jail officers um, and court security, as well as probation officers and judges um, and, and um, prosecutors and public defenders can contribute to um, that, that goal. Um, we looked as a group at um, research related to various decision points um, in, the, in the system and, and what's out there in terms of best practices um, that we could implement um, in our local criminal justice system to make us um, do a better job of achieving the goals that we are. And then finally, um, we operationalize collection of data and looking at data periodically to say, how are we doing? Um, and if we're achieving our goals, that's a one thing, but if we're not, um, the data can tell us something about why we're not and maybe we can get better. So go ahead, uh, Sam. Thanks. Um, so I, I, we're not going to go into a lot of detail about the, these EBDM activities. Again, I've included um, the address for um, the EBDM starter kit, which is uh, something that the National Institute of Corrections put together to help counties and states that are trying to implement this. I think what I want to say about this slide is that I appreciate that this looks overwhelming. Um, you know, there are a lot of steps involved in changing how systems operate. 
Um, but I think that it is, it's worth highlighting that laying a solid foundation is really important for ensuring that this framework ends up being effective in practice. Um, and it's, the truth is that many of these steps, many of these activities um, are overlapping and are already really, um, will fit well within what most counties and jurisdictions are doing. So this is really not about replacing the, the systems and the processes that are already in place in a given jurisdiction. It's really about enhancing the work that a, that a jurisdiction is doing to make sure that it's as effective as it possibly can be. Yeah, it's, um, I think I would, I would add that um, if any of you have been through a strategic planning process, it's not too different from, from that. The first time I'd ever heard the phrase logic model was when I started this process. I was like, what the heck is that? Um, you know, it's kind of like a strategic plan. Um, and so I, it helped me to think about it like that. Um, and so really what you're doing is getting decision makers in the room together and um, you're looking at objectives and then you're figuring out ways to do it and then you're figuring out ways to measure how well you did. And if you think about it kind of like a strategic plan, it's very similar. Uh, it's a, a very similar process. Um, obviously, you know, there are some, some details related to the criminal justice system that, you know, don't measure or don't completely align with biz the business world and things like that. But really, if you can think of it like strategic planning, that helped me understand the process. Um, so again, relatively briefly, I just want to give some context for the history of evidence-based decision-making. Um, initially, the EBDM initiative was conceived of as a county-level, um, local-level um, initiative. And in 2010, Grant County was selected as an EBDM site, um, one, of, one of many nationally that, that was going to receive technical assistance and support to develop a, an evidence-based decision-making process. Um, the National Institute of Correction later decided to try to see how this process might work at a state level. So the state of Indiana um, was one of, I believe, only two states in the nation that was chosen initially in 2015 to be an EBDM planning site, um, meaning that the team would form and they would do some of the foundational work. Um, and then later uh, the following year was selected as an implementation site. In 2019, we worked with our technical assistance provider to do sustainability and expansion planning. Um, some of the initial activities that the EBDM state team undertook involved mapping, um, very similar to what this group talked about earlier in this meeting about the mental health system mapping. Um, in order to sort of get a good handle on what they needed to do, they needed to have a good handle on what was already going on. And so mapping activities were undertaken with regard to different initiatives in the criminal justice system, data systems and data collection, uh, funding streams as well as just how the system generally operates. And the mapping process is really um, valuable. Um, it, it, um, when, when you're in the midst of it, you can feel like it's a little bit interminable, but it really is, you learn a lot about the system and that's why you do it, is that um, siloed individuals in a system don't typically know how the other parts of the system work. And so, you know, everybody kind of expected the circuit court judge to know how the entire system worked. And so I'd sit in these mapping meetings and, and, and a lot of times I'd say, really, that's what we do. Why do we do that? You know, a lot of times the answer would be, well, we've always done it that way. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but but um, figuring out how the pieces fit together in the system is, if you want to make changes in the system, is extremely important. Um, the, one of the laws that you want to, um, you don't want to violate in, in this process is the law of unintended consequences. And so the mapping um, exercise helps you or keeps you from violating that law of unintended consequences um, and making a change um, and not appreciating the impact of that change in this system um, of many different interdependent um, players. Yes, that's absolutely true. And system mapping, the other thing that the system mapping did with regard to the sort of state level implementation in Indiana was to help identify decision points. And decision points are exactly what they sound like. There are points in the system where, where decisions are made that could be improved or enhanced by incorporating, incorporating evidence-based knowledge and information. This is the list of decision points that the state team in Indiana identified through their mapping processes, meaning that these are opportunities that or these are um, areas that, that present potential opportunities for intervention, improvement, enhancement by infusing that evidence-based knowledge and information. 
And um, with regards to these decision points, we have done, um, you, you sort of identify, um, you know, sort of low hanging fruit and then some higher objectives and then maybe some reaches and things like that with regards to your decision points. And so we've really um, done some, done quite a bit of work on several of these decision points. You're familiar, I believe, with our work on pretrial um, and, um, and pretty significant evidence-based um, changes have been made um, in many counties in Indiana through our work in pretrial. And, um, but there are, there's work that's occurring in several other um, of, of these decision points as well, things like violation responses, um, it, you know, things like uh, diversion. Um, and so we'd like to continue um, the work that the state team has already done. And, with, you know, the, the hope is that JRAC is going to be um, the vehicle to, to continue that. There are um, uh, committees um, that have been serving of practitioners, interdisciplinary practitioners um, that have been doing this work um, as well and, and have, have helped us move forward with regards to um, these decision points. And we'd like to ultimately address all of the decision points throughout the course of the system um, um, that, are, that are listed there if we could. And I hope at some, at some later date to have an opportunity to share with the council um, some of the incredible work that has been done so far through the EBDM initiative, because I think we've done some pretty, um, pretty impressive things. Um, so I do want to talk briefly about looking to the future. So um, as I said, in 2019, um, the, the, the Indiana State team, I worked through a process of essentially strategic planning. We were trying to identify opportunities and, and ways in which to both sustain and expand the use of an implementation of evidence-based decision-making throughout the state. One of the primary um, goals of that strategic plan was a consolidation of EBDM and JRAC. Um, you know, I think what I'm trying to communicate with this slide, I hope it comes through, um, the, the two groups, the EBDM state team and, and JRAC as a council, have since their inception had, I think, some very, some very clearly shared goals. Both groups are collaborative, both groups are outcome driven, and both groups strive to be evidence informed in their practices. Um, I, this is my personal opinion, but I think that, that JRAC taking on the, um, the framework, the, the goals, the objectives, the, you know, the scope of EBDM um, is a very natural uh, transition. And I think that we also are looking forward to having an opportunity to have greater impact just through the, um, the enhanced membership of JRAC, um, the more institutionalized nature of the group. Um, so we, I think that we consider this to be a really great um, achievement of our strategic planning. Some other things that we uh, discussed through that strategic planning process, as Judge Spitzer just discussed, we have started to, with some decision points, to develop expectations and best practice guideline documents for various decision points. So pretrial is the one that I think is the most, um, is the farthest along in its development. We not only developed some best practice guidelines, but we also have moved even to the point of developing the, the pretrial services rules and the certification process. There are a lot of other opportunities um, within the system for us to figure out how to make sure that all of the local jurisdictions in the state of Indiana have access to um, some sort of expectations and best practice guidelines regarding their, whatever that given decision point may be. There are also a lot of opportunities for coordination of system-wide initiatives. So one example is crisis intervention teams or CIT. Um, you know, there are CIT um, operations in the state of Indiana. We have a statewide CIT coordinator named Marianne Halbert who works through the National Alliance for Mental Illness. Um, that is not our project, but there are opportunities for us to enhance our coordination um, with so with that project and with other similar projects to make sure that our, our criminal justice system is truly operating in a way that is coordinated and collaborative. We also discussed the need for an administrative structure. Um, the coordination and implementation of these initiatives require an investment of time and resources, primarily in the form of staff. And one of the things that we hope to be able to do is to figure out an administrative structure um, that will support JRAC initiatives and the expansion of evidence-based decision-making and initiatives at all levels throughout the state. We also discussed, obviously, fiscal issues. And I know that there has been some discussion even at previous JRAC meetings about this. 
Um, part of this is, of course, about looking for additional funding, but part of it also is about ensuring that existing funding streams are coordinated. And finally, um, Mr. Naylor brought this up just a few minutes ago, the need for training and technical assistance um, is, I think, worth uh, worth mentioning. Um, you know, IOCS has been doing a lot of work on training and technical assistance for the last number of years. Um, we have found this to be incredibly valuable in both pretrial specifically and EDDM generally. Um, so I think there are a lot of opportunities for training and technical assistance with regard to JRAC initiatives, evidence-based decision making, and other decision points. I apologize for having to go through that so quickly. <laughs> um, I know there's not actually really time for questions, but I would certainly answer any if anybody has any. Well, thank you, Judge, and thank you, Sam. Um, we have seemed to come to the end of our time, but for those members who are still able to stay on for just a couple more minutes, I, I think that we wanted to hear uh, briefly again from Mary Kay uh, about uh, the segue into uh, perhaps what the future might look like for EBDM and, and JRAC. Um, thank you, Justice Goff and Judge Spitzer and Samantha. Um, I think it's really helpful to kind of have a refresher of, of not only the, the larger goals of JRAC, but also how JRAC came to be um, with this blending of the concepts of the evidence-based decision-making initiative, along with the, the previous responsibilities of the council. Um, and I think when Samantha and Judge Spitzer were talking about the local collaboration and the training and technical assistance, um, and Chris highlight, highlighted that as well in his presentation, um, as we've been talking about ways in which we can further these initiatives and these approaches and this collaboration at the local level, and as we've been talking about what options and opportunities there may be from a legislative perspective, knowing that funds are limited, um, I would like to just begin a conversation with this group um, that I've been having with Representative Fry, where we could look at the possibility of, of really transferring this concept of JRAC and EBDM um, broadly to the local levels like we had always anticipated when we embarked on this in 2015. So when we look at the history of EBDM, we had the state EBDM policy team, we had local EBDM policy teams that started with Grant County, um, and what really works there was the collaboration um, in name of evidence-based decision-making initiative between the state and the locals. And now that we've transferred those concepts underneath the jurisdiction and the authority of the council, um, I think it's, it's worth having a conversation of can we in also institutionalize those concepts at the local level. And so what I would offer for this group's consideration um, would be whether or not there would be any willingness or interest to replicate this concept of the, the newly configured Justice Reinvestment Advisory Council at the local level. And what I mean by that is essentially developing some legislation that would support and create what would essentially be a, a local JRAC affiliate um, that would function in a very similar way to what Judge Spitzer described um, in Grant County when they use their Community Corrections Advisory Board to service their EVDM policy team. Um, and that would create a direct connection between the state and local jurisdictions on these initiatives and these conversations. Um, it would connect us to what's happening at the local level, keep us in touch with what their needs are, um, and also help us to stay in communication about ways in which we can collaborate um, on current and future projects. I think the really important thing to consider is that, you know, counties have a lot of really great things going on. They have some things in place, some of their, some of the counties already have EBDM policy teams. Some of them have very high functioning community corrections advisory boards or other criminal justice councils. So we wouldn't want to replace or reinvent the wheel and anything that great that was already happening locally. What we would want to do is provide resources to counties who are high functioning um, to take them to the next level, but then also to bring counties um, to the table who, uh, who have had challenges um, related to collaboration or who could benefit from some training and technical assistance to achieve some of their goals. So Justice Goff, what I would like to start a conversation with and conversation I've had with Representative Fry, and it, Representative Fry, certainly if, if you want to add to that, um, whether or not this group would, would be willing to consider supporting um, that concept, um, obviously it would be something that would be subject to drafting um, and legislation. Uh, we would not want to put additional burdens on counties with really the goal would be is that we would want to be able to provide them resources and assistance. 
So with that, um, I would turn it over to Representative Fry to see if he would like to make any comments um, about what I've just said. Thank you, Mary Kay. And uh, as you said, we've had discussions about this and I'm happy to, uh, to help draft legislation and try to move this initiative forward if that's uh, what the group decides. I think uh, looking back on the uh, jail overcrowding task force, one of the things that we found uh, that was pretty surprising, I guess, to me was that how many different counties had a different reason for their jail overcrowding. Uh, one, one county would uh, be a result of, of a certain issue and then the next county, maybe even next door was something different. And so uh, as uh, Mary Kay said in our conversations, we thought uh, having local uh, control or local input uh, on uh, how best to handle these situations was a lot better than trying to make a one size fits all from the state level. Uh, is that pretty close, Mary Kay? Yes, sir. So uh, with that, Justice Goff, that's um, what, what we're thinking. And uh, certainly we would like to get the feeling uh, from the council. Well, thank you, Representative Fry, and thank you, uh, as always, Mary Kay. We're over time, and we uh, did not intend to put this to a vote today, not because we don't think this is a good idea, but because we think this is a big idea. And our hope was that the various members would be able to take the concept back to their constituent groups and, and, and feel them out and uh, plan on uh, voting on, on the concept and support of the concept at our next meeting. I think that's still the idea. And uh, Mary Kay and, and Representative Fry have already reached out to some of those constituent members. But uh, please think that over. And for those commission members or council members who are still on the uh, call, please feel free to reach out to, uh, to Representative Fry, Mary Kay, or myself uh, and, and discuss this further in advance of the, uh, the next meeting. Um, Justice Goff, if I could, sir. Yes, please. Um, I, I think maybe uh, as time is uh, getting closer, maybe Mary Kay and I could sit down and draft some sort of a, of a uh, initial language for legislation that we could also share at the next meeting. Uh, my fear is that if we continue to put things off, we will just run out of time, especially quality time. So with, uh, with your permission, I would like to try to uh, come up with initial language anyway that we could share. It's going to always be a... Um, changed or refined. Right. Yeah, I'm sure we can work on something between now and the next meeting. Uh, just for those members who are still on, there is our next scheduled meetings I indicated earlier on October 28th from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. And uh, there is a tentative meeting scheduled on November 16th from 9.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. An invitation for both meetings has been forwarded to members. So thank you again uh, for taking the time to participate in today's meeting and for your continued work serving our Indiana communities. Have a great weekend, everybody.